Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Eat Sleep Suplex Retweet. I am a currently self-isolating Ross McLeod. I miss my friends, but more importantly, I miss my girlfriend Haley. I have a feeling that I will soon become like Jake Peralta in solitary confinement and start to make my own <laughs> out of mashed potatoes. <laughs> I never went. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. This is Ross's retro review, and I'm joined by someone who I used to think overestimated his own importance to the world around him. <laughs> but then, as soon as he announces he's leaving Eat Sleep Suplex Retweet, the world apparently just falls into disarray. Hey, I know. David Campbell, David, how are you? I, you know, I'm not saying that the pandemic is because I am leaving Eat Sleep Suplex Retweet. I'm just saying that the, the, the consistency with the timing that you point out, it, it's interesting. It's interesting, Ross. It's almost like... The universe is crying out for me to stay, but of course this is the greatest farewell tour of all time. It passes through retro reviews today, passes through Saturday Draft Live, passes through the debating chamber, and then on to winning the title at WrestleMania. Here we go, baby! <laughs> you know that way you just instantly regret giving someone that wee bit of credit? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm going out. I'm going out. I'm not going to go out being like, oh, yeah, it was a nice time. No, I'm going out the way I came in. Right, I'm, 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 no, I'm not making any bones about this. I want to beat everyone on the way out. That'll be the greatest thing for me if I'm able to do that. <laughs> going out the way you came into this world. A total mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Just a crying little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, of course, listening to Ross's Retro Review on Suplex Retweet Extra. You're either using iTunes, Android or Spotify. But you can also use those platforms to catch our main channel, Eat Sleep Suplex Retweet, and of course, social media, the big four, at Suplex Retweet, Tinder, at Jack Graham, and <laughs> at Ryan Wilson. That's at <laughs> Ryan Wilson. What oh, right? about Sorry. Grinder at Ryan Gallagher. That's Grinder at Ryan Gallagher. <laughs> You know, you, they, they don't use the ats on Grindr uh, as a man who has personally smack in <laughs> Moving swiftly on to David's <laughs> trick <trichology. laughs> <laughs> We're reviewing today No Mercy, coming to us from the Pepsi Arena in Albany, New York. Albany, New York, of course, the home of the Steam Tam. Uh, ah, yes. <laughs> No Mercy took place on the 22nd of October uh, 2000 and drew 14,342 fans. Uh, it's the third edition of No Mercy and this, I, I don't remember this fondly because I'm getting to the main event later on, but I actually really enjoyed watching this back. It's, it's one I didn't struggle to watch. What were your thoughts of watching it for the first time with sort of no context, David? I think there's there's definitely good bits about it and there's certain people and characters that stand out that we obviously we'll get into. Overall, I just think it's a bit of a so-so show just because I think the central storyline overshadowed the rest of what was happening and even because it ended up polluting the main event match a wee bit, I felt there was a mm -hmm. bit of disfocus to the show. Overall, like you say, though, I enjoyed it and there was some really, really good wrestling in there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what David's talking about is Stone Cold Steve Austin's return to the ring. We are currently at the time where it was revealed Rikishi ran over Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone Cold's first match in 11 months will be against Rikishi in a no-holds-barred match. And, you know, I do see what you mean. It does overshadow the fact that Chris Benoit and... Uh, Triple H are fighting in the semi-main event. We have the Rock and Cut Angle for the WWF title in the actual main event. But the first three or four matches on the card, the commentary is just all about this match. Like, where Stone Cold? <laughs> do you think Stone Cold will show up? What's Rikishi going to do when Stone Cold shows up? What's Stone Cold going to do to Rikishi when he shows up? You know, it is just, as you said, very centric. Yeah, and I think it was like uh, they, they said that, oh, Eddie betrayed China, just like Rikishi and the Ren, and Stone Cold is still not here. And I was like, right, okay, I said in the last retro review I was on, I like how 
uh, J.R. and King can remind you of the wider context and are good storytellers, but sometimes they were just reaching for it a bit here, you know, and it did detract from everything else that was going on around uh, throughout the show. It's something that I've been critical when you... It's why I can't go back and watch WCW sometimes, mm. because a lot of the commentary is just, you think Hulk Hogan's going to do tonight? Like, I, I don't care. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I'll care about it when you know when Hulk Hogan fights Savage or fights Warrior or fights Sting. I'll care about it, but at the minute, you know, I'm watching Harlem Heat versus Steiner Brothers, or I'm watching Rey Mysterio versus Eddie Guerrero. You know, I want to care yeah. about that. Yeah, exactly. And they, they, we've said this uh, till blue in the face about the Attitude Era. Everyone on the show mattered, but when you're doing stuff like this, it detracts. It detracts from that a wee bit because I don't really need to be hearing about Rock and Austin uh, when we've got the greatest technical wrestler on the planet, Naked Midian, you know, standing <laughs> in the ring. I just want, I want to appreciate the art at that point. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to take a wee 10 minutes just to talk about some of the filler on the card. Mm. And, well, seeing as you mentioned them, we'll start with him first. Yes. Naked Midian versus William Regal for the European title. Jesus suffering fuck, this goes on. <laughs> <laughs> Austin and Rikishi and obviously we'll get into that but it goes on after Austin and Rikishi it's the definition of a come down match I think yeah um, I don't quite know what to say <laughs> like the naked Midian gimmick is is something I've heard of uh, I've not quite seen it a lot before I, I will say I feel sorry for him uh, he's trying to he's trying to be, his best to hype the crowd up before the match starts and they're still barely in it even though he's like come on if you're waving his hands in the air and he's got like a he's getting a modest reception but it's clear that no one wants to see this man <laughs> take his clothes off um the the shining light of this match is that william regal just proves how good an actual wrestler he is throughout it um, like the, the moves he's hitting and the, the, the things he's doing are just remarkably crisp um, and also showing off his comedy chops like there is no one who does a horrified expression better than William Regal does so uh, for what it was worth for continuing Regal's European title reign um, I, I, it was a success in that regard I just think you know Midian's one of those the characters left in the bin never to be spoke of again to be, to be honest with you I nearly <clears throat> I nearly choked, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's what thinking about Naked Midian does to you. You know, know. <laughs> it just gets you. It gets you choking from whatever you're drinking, man. Just no doing it. <laughs> Apologies to anyone listening in that hears me coughing during David's. Jesus Christ. <laughs> 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 Leave that, and I'm a professional, fuck this. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Jesus. The last time you and I reviewed a show that the European title was on the line, Chris Jericho fought Eddie Guerrero. This is um, somewhat of a come down. Yeah, it's... Um, I wouldn't say William yeah. Eagle is a come down from those two because he does fit in that bracket of workhorse wrestler for this time period. He's one of those technicians on the card that you know you can turn to that will put you on a guaranteed crisp wrestling match. Naked Midian <laughs> is not one of those people. He is most certainly not uh, one of those uh, one of those characters at this time. So it's a weird matchup. It's it's like a definite clash of styles. Um, it does. It's not the worst match on the card. I don't think. I think it it does the job. It furthers William Regal. Gives Regal a win in pay per view. And uh, the man in the scud uh, gets <laughs> gets beaten, which he always should. So, <laughs> how how shocked would you be if I told you that Naked Midian is a former European champion? <laughs> I'd like to say shocked, if ever. Um, this just seems fitting for the time, I suppose. <laughs> by the same token, so. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm disappointed, but I wouldn't say shocked. <laughs> he, um, he found it in Shane McMahon's bag because Shane McMahon retired the title. Right. So <laughs> he'd be the last ever un uh, European champion, undefeated European champion. And because it was a corporate ministry time, yeah. uh, he, was, he was given the belt as a reward. 
and he lost it like 40 days later to D'Lo Brown. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that, see, that's the thing, like, it's all well and good, like I say, Regal's the type of guy that can give prestige to a title like that, but there's nothing worse than when a title's just used as a prop, and there's there's no gravitas yeah. behind it, you know, and it just seems like um, putting it on Midian or, or someone like that, even Dio Brown, who actually will talk about him later on, but... He's just, he's no a drawing power guy, he's no a guy who's going to elevate that title. The one good thing about that scene here was Regal was getting a good reception, he's getting good heel heat, so he, he yeah. probably is the right guy to put it on at this time. Yeah, because obviously I've, I've said it, I say it on just about every retro review, Eddie Guerrero, my favourite European champion, is four months reign I thought was great, and when he loses it to Perry Satin, Perry becomes the corner man for Terry as she continues her feud with the cat. <laughs> <laughs> that Al great feud. Yes, who is Al Snow in her corner. The title was used as a prop in that feud for when Al Snow wins it. Al Snow starts coming out, try to challenge for the hardcore title with the European title. He's now coming out every week. His theme song is in a different European language. <laughs> <laughs> And then nice. when he came out, his language was Chinese and William Regal was in commentary, horrified, going, China is not in Europe, this man is an embarrassment to Europe. <laughs> William Regal won the title, but I'm thank as you said, William Regal's the sort of guy, but I think we've talked way too much about this match. We've given, <laughs> ironically, we've gave Naked Midian way too much exposure. <laughs> oh yes, here we go. <laughs> Keep these coming. <laughs> yes. So we'll move on to something you mentioned, which is D'Lo Brown. He took place. He took part in the Dudley Boys Tag Team Table Invitational Tournament. Um, try saying that five times fast. <laughs> uh, it was Lowdown, which was D'Lo Brown and Chaz from the Headbangers. Too cool. Uh, Goodfather and Bill Buchanan, podcast favourite <laughs> of the <rest. laughs> Raven and Taz and the Dudley Boys. Um, for an opener, I thought this was pretty good. It got the crowd excited, a couple of big table spots, and it really just got the crowd on their feet, got the crowd hot for the rest of the card, I thought. Yeah, it's. Um, I'd say it's like a pre show match that's no in the pre show, to be honest with you, just because there's no real, or from what I could tell, there wasn't a real story behind it. You know, it just seemed like, right, we want some of these popular teams to have a place on the card. So this gives them something to do. Obviously, it's a table match. So you're guaranteed to get some excitement there. You know you're going to have at least uh, four or five folks go through a table uh, at some point during the match. Again, starting the show with Too, too Cool, uh, which is the same as the last time I was on. Uh, too Cool, uh, probably I'd say a lesser reception here. Uh, than they did in the UK, but it's still you can still tell they're one of the most popular acts. Uh, I did feel sorry for D'Lo and uh, uh, whatever jobber he was teamed with, Chez or Chaz or whatever his name is. Yeah. Uh, I think <laughs> I think D'Lo deserved better. Uh, and <laughs> I think D'Lo still does deserve better. Uh, D'Lo Brown, he's an underrated worker. Uh, he just never really had a, a character. I don't think you could really get behind, so it's a shame. Uh, my favourite person in the match, once again, as you alluded to, Ross McLeod, is legend of the game, Bill Buchanan, um, coming out here <laughs> with, the, with the right to censor the good father. Uh, and it may surprise you to hear, I, I am all for the right to censor's message. You know, they are for the majority, not the minority. And they were cheated out of the end of this match, quite frankly, because the heel work and the innovation that they used to cheat in a tables match, which has no disqualifications, I thought was ingenious, and I, I wish they'd left the ending of the match as it was and didn't have the restart, because I thought that was just excellent heel trickery. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Tukul's reception. This is why the Rikishi heel turn, which we'll touch on later, is sort of overanalyzed and maybe not as appreciated as it was because mm. he, him, along with Tuku, were you know they were the undercard sort of they were top of the undercard. They constantly get cheered, cheers on a par with the likes of you know only beaten by the likes of The Rock and Stone Cold, mm -hmm. and then 
when Rikishi turned heel, too cool sort of died a death by you yeah. know, guilt by association. And the reaction you can hear like just a slight undercut of booze, and you're like, ah, oh, shit, they've yeah. ruined, it. ruined too um, cool and all. Yeah, and obviously you're alluding to the finish, so we'll just we'll quickly just give the results for the match. Um, too cool eliminate lowdown. Uh, Raven and Taz eliminate Too Cool. The Dudley Boys eliminate Raven and Taz. The Acolytes and the Dudley Boys were having a sort of feud with the right to censor at this time. So this is mm-hmm. really the only storyline going into it. So you knew that was going to be the, like, the last two. You could see it coming a mile away. Yeah. Um, so we have Bubba who puts, is it Bill Buchanan? Yeah, he puts Bill through the table, um, which broke my heart. And then um, the good father takes out uh, uh, Bubba and he lands on top of Bill Buchanan on top of the table. The good father then pulls the Bill Buchanan away. By the time the referee comes to his senses, he sees uh, Bubba lying on top of a broken table. So thus, he, he, in, a, in an Eddie Guerrero um, a level of trickery, the ref then believes that the right to censor have won the match, so calls for the bell. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, VAR comes into play. <laughs> um, he grasses the right to censor in. The match restarts, and Goodfather gets a 3D for his trouble through the table. Goodfather at this point, I mean, Godfather's never been the most agile and athletic, but he's looking as slow as I'm eating a jail here. He, he can tell he is someone who. He's a product of a different era, you know what I mean? He was a product of the character era, and yeah. as, even though it's the Attitude Era, this is sort of around the era where we're heading to Ruthless Aggression, there's a lot more emphasis on the wrestling matches. There's some great matches on this card. Godfather sticks out like a sore thumb, because he's just so slow. I think he um, been wrestling a long time by this point. Um, obviously, Papa Shango, Callum Mufasa, Goodfather, Godfather. He'd went through an evolution. And I think that Charles Wright is deserving of a spot in the WWE Hall of Fame because of his longevity in the company and especially because of the Godfather gimmick, which was one of the most popular uh, of the Attitude Era and was still popular whenever it came back for like anniversary shows and that. But you are right. Um, he's in there with the Dudley boys uh, when they're at or near their prime um, of their WWE careers at least and his partner Bill Buchanan like I've already said and I'm no joking he is an underrated performer and he can go so you're right he sticks out like a sore thumb the one good thing he does have though is he knows where to be what time to be there like he's a good he's a good worker and he's a good ring general he's a good pair of hands to have in with you but yeah it just slows the week in the jail like you say yeah. Um, so Dudleys win the table, t- the table match. Sorry, the Dudleys tack table invitational. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the Dudley boys won the opening match. That's all you need to know. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> Love it. We move on to something. I was, I didn't want to put this in the rest section. I wanted to put this as the last talking point. This was my main event. This. Oh. Here we go. <laughs> Mr. Ass, Billy Gunn makes his return after being taken out by those damn Dudleys. And no way out. Billy Gunn's back. Billy Gunn supposed to be taking on um, Eddie Guerrero for the Intercontinental title. Eddie Guerrero was injured before the pay per view. So Billy Gunn once again robbed of an Intercontinental title match. Just, just outrageous. But the gentleman that he is, he comes to China's aid. And the two of them take on Stephen Richards and Val Venus, who looks like an ice cream man, by the way, yeah. of the right to censor. Yeah, he I looks spoke... like Isaac Yankum. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to Strack about this um, on the Unforgiven show. Val looks like he didn't get the memo to come in. White shirt, black tie, black trousers. He shows up. He's got the white shirt and the black tie. He's got massive... <laughs> Massively too big for him, I should say. White trousers. I mean, yeah. 
surely a Kmart or a Target was open that he could get 38 waist black trousers, you know what I mean? I mean, America's a place well known for its, its punchier, should we say, citizens. You could have got, you know, you could have got any size black trousers. Why the fuck is he cutting about dressed like an ice cream man? I, I, I do not have the answers for you, Ross. You know, um, from my experience, uh, there's a target in every corner. Uh, when you look in America, that man could have found something to wear. Um, on, the, on the topic of the, the right to censor, I do have to say that Stevie, Stevie Richards we know is a man who can grow an exceptional head of hair. So to see him with the shaved back and sides here is an absolute disgrace to humanity. Get the hair back, Stevie boy. Where is it? <laughs> I mean, in this time of uncertainty and lockdown, more and more people are getting the clippers out. I think we can see <laughs> Richard's return for 2020. I don't want it. No, I don't want it. It was. It's the same way of. It's the same shock I have uh, seeing uh, old HBK's baldy head these days, man. I just can't. I can't do it. I seen Stephen Richards here, and I was just like, ah, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're in the midst of a Chinese Eddie. Chinese eye. China. I, I want to say Eddie and China at the same time when it came out. Chinese. <laughs> Chinese. That racist. <laughs> <laughs> It's fucking hell. Uh, China and Eddie Guerrero are in the middle of a, a breakup sort of storyline, which is a shame because the Latino Heat storyline I thought went longer. I thought mm. we would get more of China and Eddie Guerrero because they just worked well, so well together. They played off each other brilliantly, I thought. I think um I think you're right. However, it's also entertaining to see China with just about everybody and that run of our career with Eddie uh, arguably some people's fondest memories of China, some people's fondest memories of Eddie including uh, his, his greater success later on but I do I do like the pairing here of um, Billy Gunn in China because it's actually quite a effective tag team uh, I, had to, I would have liked to have seen these two get like a proper tag team run because they, they demolished the right to censor your Billy Gun with all the power moves. Uh, China was like throwing people about like crazy, and it was just shenanigans, you know, shenanigans in the end again. Actually, the shenanigans that prevent them from picking up the big one. Yeah, the finish comes. Eddie comes down with the the bouquet of roses with the lead pipe in the middle of it. This was a China specialty move when she was his manager. Hits China in the back of the head. China gets pinned by Val. Right to censor, pick up the win. But China goes, gets a match with Eddie at Survivor Series in the next month. And if you like the team of China and Billy Gunn, you'll like the Survivor Series team of China, Billy Gunn, Road Dog, and R Truth. <laughs> nice man, a bit of truth. I love it. Is it is he is K Quick at this point, isn't it? Yeah, K Quick, and he doesn't look like he's aged a day. <laughs> that man, he'll, he'll still be performing at WrestleMania 40, man. Uh, I think Truth's such an underrated performer. I wish I might go and watch that after this, just that match, just to see a bit of how Truth interacts with those guys, because that seems like a dream tandem, man. <laughs> it is such a bizarre thing to think of, <laughs> because I forgot who, but who else is on this. Let's run about. 2012, and I'm like, who is it? Like, K-Quick, who the hell's K-Quick? And you look up, it's R-Truth, you're like, oh, for <sighs> fuck's sake, he looks the exact same. <laughs> mental, man, that's absolutely mental. Um, in China as well, again, a star. Crowd's completely behind her. Doesn't look out of place wrestling with the men. Um, I don't think you'll ever have a star again like China, uh, because she was never really imitated well. Uh, she'll never be duplicated, and Again, a highlight of this show for me is watching China go at it. Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree with you. Um, something I will say, the pre-match promo with Billy Gunn and China, you can tell why D and DX, it was Sean and Triple H, and for Latino Heat, it was Eddie that did the talking for China. Yeah. And Billy was always the guy who finished the catchphrase and Road Dog did all the talking, they're not exactly the best on the mic. China does the job though, you know, China 
it's straight laced. It's it's very straightforward. It's to the point, which you'd expect from her. Uh, Billy does stumble over his words, though. I think a bit more. I think he suffers more from not having the heavy lifting of the talking done for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and finally, on the rest, it was a match that wasn't ma- wasn't a match. Um, the APA and the women's champion Lita. This was the closest we've had to a women's championship match on this show so far, by the way. <laughs> very close, very close. <laughs> yes. Lita wins the title before SummerSlam and in the two months prior, uh, she's held in the Hardy Boys, but there's no sign of the women's title. She just comes out, attacks someone, leaves. Uh, the APA and Lita versus TNA and Trish. Um, Trish used the sort of a and this is no disrespect to Trish Stratus or any of the women at the time, it's just the way they were booked. She's used as a sort of bimbo, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, used to distract, like, it's boobs and it's bums and it's, you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. actually there, a one-on-one. Um, it's a shame we don't see the match because Albert and Tess take out the APA before the match. The three of them then go to take out Lita. The Hardy Boys make the save, and then it just sort of ends. There's nothing, nothing much else really to talk about, is there? Well, there's some good to it because I agree with you. You're saying about Trish to an extent, but it does show a layer to her character because she's in the back and she's saying, uh, "Yeah, I'll just distract them with these, obviously." But then it turns out she has another plan all along, and has TNA go and beat up the acolytes, and then she takes out Lita from behind. So it shows that. There's more to Trish Stratus than is meeting the eye and she's playing on your expectations of what she's going to do, showing that she is a woman with a plan, she's a manager uh, with with ideas, she's not just going to rely on the trick of using you know her breasts to distract the opponent all the time, you know, so I do like that wrinkle to it, I have to say. Very true. Um, but- it's our first of two no contests of the night, so <laughs> we'll just sort of leave that one there. Um, and we'll jump right into our first, uh, our second, sorry, our first of three championship matches of the night. The second one we reviewed on the show. Uh, the Hardy Boys, the WWF Tag Team Champions, defending against Los Conquistadores, who I have put in brackets. Definitely not Edge and Christian. No, definitely not. No, uh, Jerry's, Jerry's, I agree with Jerry Lawler. Um, it's, it's nothing more, nothing less than uh, a mere speculation um, from uh, a GR at this point. And I think it's outrageous that this is really the dawn of fake news, Ross. I think it just has to be said. Because Jim Ross is a, is a man of the media and they have a responsibility to us to make sure that things are getting across truthfully and they're not causing mass hysteria and panic for no reason. And that's exactly what Jim Ross is doing in this match. And I, I wouldn't stand for it, quite personally. <laughs> um, did you see the bit in the match where JR nearly trips up Lawler? <laughs> no, what happened? <laughs> so, I must have missed this. So they're called, uh, is it Uno and Uno, Uno and Dos? That's yeah. what they're meant to be called. That's the and it goes like that. He goes like that to Lawler. Is that is that Doss or is that Christian? That's Christian. I mean, um, I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> I nearly gets him. I see, because he's confusing King, of course. Uh, that sort of you're being banged over the head with that fake news. You know, you're eventually going to uh, get confused by it. You know, I feel for I feel for King here. You know, uh, J- Jr. knows what he's doing. A, a very malicious man uh, is all I have to say about Jim Ross. Ro- <laughs> Ross. <laughs> Jim Ross Ross died. Jim Ross Ross. <laughs> Try saying that with a lisp. <laughs> um, I like the, the promos beforehand. They just say, si senor, si. Si mm. senor, si. Arriba. And then <laughs> King is bringing their phrases going, I mean, that's a multilingual tag team. I mean, they know, they know very little English, but like they know very little Spanish either, King. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think um, I think JR's just been a bit um, horrible, quite frankly. I don't want to use the word racist. I think that's a bit strong, but uh, a, a legitimate Spanish-speaking tag team coming into WWE, uh, the Conquistadors are an important step 
in um, a representation in the tag team division. And I don't know what Jim Ross's problem is, but I'm all for it. I am all for it. You've, you've really taken this stand here, haven't you? You've, you've backed ah, yourself. Listen, listen, right? I, I know nothing more or nothing less than what is presented to me on pay-per-view. <laughs> And I, I see um, my own eyes. The story of the Christian match is Matt and them. Jeff Hardy. Basically, they 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 know it's Edge and Christian. They 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 want the mask off Lost Conquistadors to prove it's Edge and Christian. The closest they get is near the end of the match. They get one mask off them. All they find out they have another mask underneath. Yep. And they walk just by coincidence. They walk straight into a kill switch. Which so happens to be Christian's move as well. Just a uh, complete coincidence. Oh, well, you could easily say, oh, is it Tyler Breeze? You know, is it, is it any a number of independent wrestlers who use the kill switch? Again, mere speculation. And you're feeding into this lie, Ross. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, conquistadors pick up the win. One, two, three. Um, so, obviously... As much as we're joking, it is Edge and Christian under the masks. Mm-hmm. Um, we see after the match, Edge and Christian come in, they give Los Conquistadors a Corona. Not mm-hmm. the virus, I'm here. They're <laughs> in there. Um, do you know who the stand-in Conquistadors were when Edge and Christian weren't wrestling? Oh, I'm going to have to take a, a, a guess. I suppose... Oh, fuck. I don't know. <laughs> Who is it? So, one of them is current AEW superstar Christopher Daniels. No way. Fallen mm-hmm. Angel Christopher Daniels. Love that yep. guy. Who else? And the other one is an absolute criminal who stabbed John Cena in a nightclub. It was Carlito's bodyguard, Jesus. Jesus? Mm-hmm. Oh, f- but listen, you know... That, that just shows you the level that you're dealing with uh, with the Contistadors, two legends of the game. You know, I'm a huge, huge fan of this team and well done on their first uh, WWF uh, tag team title reign here. Long may it continue. <laughs> this isn't the only time they bring... So, obviously, in the 80s, the Conquistadors were a sort of... They were like the 10th team. See when they needed more teams for Survivor Series? Aye. Sort of put Latin American wrestlers under a mask and went, but you're the Conquistadors. They brought it back in 2003 for a random match. Uh, it was Rob Conway and Eugene under the mask to take on Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman. <laughs> <laughs> At Vengeance 03, they had Rob Conway and Johnny from the Spirit Squad take place in the APA Barroom Brawl. Listen, um, God rest their souls, uh, the Contestadors, you know, um, and two two more shiny gold uh, spandex wearing stars in the sky, as far as I'm concerned, future Hall of Famers. Um, you can say all you want about these different people who played them, but I know in my heart of hearts there are only ever two Conquistadors and God rest their souls. <laughs> um, Edge and Christian then say, to the Conquistadors' first WWE, WWF Tag Team title defence on Raw tomorrow night against Edge and Christian. So, do you know what happens on Raw? No, no clue. <laughs> so, Edge and Christian obviously think it's going to be the people they hired and they're going to just lie down and give them the titles. It turns out the Hardy Boys take out Christopher Daniels and Jesus. They put the masks on and then they sort of turn the tables on Edge and Christian and win back the titles. Oh, you know, that's just, that's just a joke. You know, that's that's a huge strategy from the Hardys right there. Impersonating an artist. <laughs> Never see Hedge and Christian I mean, doing something like that. Turn about fair play, that's my view on it. But I mean, <laughs> you are the ultimate huge view. You know. It's a joke. It's an absolute disgrace what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on to our next match we're going to review. Um, Y2J, Chris Jericho versus X-Pac in a steel cage match. This is a continuation of their feud from Unforgiven. Y2J won the match, but after the match, X-Pac attacks him with the nunchucks in a steel chair. Um, <laughs> X-Pac is t- finally taking a bit of a hint that DX is finished, is not coming back. You know, he, 
we've kind of been shouting at him like Garth and Wayne's World live in the now <laughs> <laughs> he's, brought, he's brought back the black and red gear that he wore ironically when DX were at its peak you know what I mean mm. he never used to wear the DX gear and then as soon as it was dying off he's like yeah I'll, I'll put the gear on like no it's too late too late <laughs> definitely um, I never got X Pac really um, but here I understand what people mean when they say X Pac was like the measuring stick for a performer at this time because we know how talented Chris Jericho is um, people obviously to see about X Pac all the time. This is just a very good match. It's a very well put together match, and I found myself buying into this. I had no idea really what story these two had. Um, Jericho alluded to a long history between them before the match, which I thought was pretty good to help me buy into it. But solid spots all round. There was a couple of really brutal bumps that folk took in this match, particularly X Pac. There's a point where. Um, he gets he, he runs at Jericho, I think, and Jericho throws him into the cage and he hits it quite high before just coming right down on like the back of his neck almost and it, it looked really brutal. And that's what I liked about this match. It wasn't perfect. There was a lot of um sort of rough around the edges moments, but I feel that added to the sort of like stiff nature of it. It was really good. Yeah, it's the it's the classic use of what the steel cage should be, you know. I mean it's not just a match on Raw. It's not just a, an attraction match, it's, you know, extreme rules just because we need to have it. It's a sort of, it's an end of the feud thing. And this was the end of Jericho and x Pac's feud that had been going on since the night after SummerSlam. And, and, you know, we, we talk about some of the bumps x Pac took. x Pac heat is in full flow here, as you mentioned. But he takes some amount of punishment, he takes a power bomb from basically he's on the top of the cage and Jericho's on the top rope and Jericho drops him 15 feet onto the back of his head. And it's, it, honest to God, man, it's it's brutal some of the stuff you're seeing in this match. Even even the finish looked like it fucking hurt. <laughs> I don't see any way that it couldn't, I have to be honest with you. Um, this is what is good about the Attitude Era. Um, for me, when it's at its best, it is it uses that rougher style of wrestling, the more intense style of wrestling, but it doesn't rely on it. Uh, Jericho and x Pac still manage to tell a really good story in the cage and keep you guessing. And it's it, on top of being a really brutal wrestling match, it's also a really just good wrestling match inside the cage. Um, and yeah, very, very impressed with it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to take you through the finish of the match, um, Jericho, sorry, x Pac climbs to the top of the cage, Jericho follows him, Jericho locks in the walls of Jericho on the top of the cage, only for x Pac to at a low blow and throw Jericho off the cage. x Pac climbs over the cage, stands on top of the door and poses, and Jericho sees the opening, drop kicks the cage wall, which moves the door, and x Pac goes gangly's first, right into the door. Jesus. And as Jericho dives right out the door for the win, and X Pac is left hanging like the cat and the hang in there, baby memes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's one of those finishes where you're sure that X Pac has it won because Jericho is just taking a huge bump off the cage. So when he does drop kick the door, I will say that spot's quite hard to pull off because that can't be predictable how that door's going to swing. So X Pac does really well. To actually pull off that bump successfully without falling to the floor below, um, but it was a really good, a really unpredictable ending to it. I loved the the walls of Jericho on top of the cage. Uh, it was a really cool visual as well, um, and something different. Uh, so yeah, it was a really good finish. It was a finish that didn't make X Pack look too weak, but it also made Jericho look like a, a sort of fighting uh, underdog. So yeah, I was all for it. Really good finish. A really good match. Yeah, and also it was a match that was only 10 minutes long. It was a blow-off match, but it didn't exactly, you know, rip the arse out of it. It was just, you were in, you were out, you were done. And Jericho moves on to a feud in the next month that is definitely not about coffee. It's about coffee, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you, you could argue it's about coffee, but a certain person... A certain big red machine, not to spoil who it is, argues that it's not about coffee. 
<laughs> Fair enough. I will ask no more questions. <laughs> um, so we move on to our next match. Triple H versus Chris Benoit. Um, so this... I'm, I'm going to talk to you about something outside of wrestling at the time. Mm-hmm. And I spoke to I spoke to Stephen on the SummerSlam review and Strack on the Un- Unforgiven review. It's um, round about this time that in the midst of the Kurt Angle, Triple H, Stephanie McMahon love triangle, where Stephanie was going to leave Triple H for Kurt, mm-hmm. that Stephanie becomes head of WWE Creative. Right. She becomes the head writer. And it's round about that time that that angle just gets kiboshed. It's completely, <coughs> excuse me, out the window. And all of a sudden, Stephanie McMahon, when it comes to Triple H, is the damsel in distress. She's the good guy, you know. We, we see a completely different side here in the main event. She's the good guy. She's the doting wife. She's, she's poor wee Stephanie. And all of a sudden, Triple H is the big face. He's the, the gallant husband. Mm. And this is this is why, if obviously you you're a ruthless aggression sort of person, you've came in at that era. You yeah. you witnessed you witnessed the reign of terror. This is why going further back, people don't really like Triple H. Mm-hmm. To the love he gets now for NXT, which is very well earned. You could also argue some of the hate he gets round about this era is very well earned because. We see the match begin, and he's facing Chris Benoit, who is quite possibly, other than Kurt Angle, the best all-round wrestler in the company. And we have Triple H out-wrestling him. I'm going to say this, right? I'll say this about it. Mm -hmm. Triple H, from my perspective, and I wrote this down, it seems like at this point they're ready to embrace him as a babyface. You have those hardcore sections of the crowd that it's cutting to that are quite aggressively shouting for Triple H at the start mm-hmm. of it. Now, I know what you're saying because it's, it's inconsistent the way he's presented throughout the broadcast and even throughout the angle. Like you said, I know what the future is going to hold for him in terms of the Rikishi story and stuff like that. So it seems odd uh, that they present him as, as the, the, the babyface in this match against Benoit. In terms of the booking of it, I actually do think it's a necessary thing to add to Triple H's character because before the match, King's just saying, yeah, he's the big guy who can throw big punches. And we know that not to be true of Triple H. Even his biggest detractors are not going to say that Triple H is not a man, is a man who definitely does know the technical side of wrestling as well as the power move side of it. So I actually thought it was good to see him go toe-to-toe with Benoit here. Um, and it is clear that the only reason he beats Benoit in the end is because of the strategic help of Stephanie. Now you can take you can take that for what it is, and I, I completely get the hate and I completely understand what you're saying. But from my perspective, coming into this match, I actually felt it was a really good story getting told. And if they committed to the idea of a Triple H full-on babyface hero turn, then I think this match works better just in the context of if you looking at it for the context and knowing what's coming I think that's why you know it doesn't have a particularly good taste to it if that makes any sense yeah yeah absolutely um, Stephanie isn't at ringside for the start of the match mm-hmm. we've seen at uh, SummerSlam she accidentally hit Triple H and he accidentally hit her during the WWF title match mm-hmm. Triple H had the WWF title won she brought Kurt Angle back to ringside to help him against The Rock. Kurt wanted the title for himself and cost Triple H, ultimately costing him the title. Stephanie is involved in the romance triangle, now the business partnership with Kurt Angle. She also accidentally cost Triple H a match, sorry, a WWF Championship match, when Benoit grabbed Stephanie's hair in the middle of a triple threat in a more contenders match. Stephanie went, Triple H went to check on Stephanie and Angle pounced. Triple H is saying Stephanie's a sort of liability at ringside at this point. So it's played into her returning to Kurt Angle to manage him to show she's not a liability. But she's also at ringside 
when the ref's back's turned, slaps a uh, slapping Benoit, and she's also involved in the finish. She distracts Triple H. Sorry, she distracts the referee while Triple H and Benoit are chain wrestling. They're going back and forward in a great, you know, tug of war. He goes for the pedigree. Benoit reverses to the cross face. Triple H reverses back to the pedigree, back to the cross face. And eventually Triple H goes low, which I think that's my problem with it, the inconsistency. Mm-hmm. Yes, we know you're going to be full on heel again, but they've been... It was. It's just, I think, because I've watched these, you know, f- wee bit behind the curtain for anyone listening in, the past three retro reviews have been filmed in the past three days. So I've watched these pay-per-views one after another mm-hmm. and watched, like, video packages on YouTube and all that to kind of get my knowledge in for the storylines that were happening in between because the attitude era moves that fast. Yeah. But it's just, it's the inconsistent tones, I think, annoy me and it's when you can tell... That yes, fans want to turn him face. Yes, WWE want to keep him sort of shades of grey because he is going to be revealed as the Stone Cold attacker. Mm-hmm. But it, it just it, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. You know what I mean? I think for, for my for my watching anyway. Yeah, and I, I completely I completely see that point. And I, I must say this: like people will know if they've listened to the best WrestleMania main event show uh, that's on the main feed right now. I'm not Chris Benoit's biggest fan, um, and it's not only because of what happened in 2007. I just feel that he doesn't have the star power, uh, quite mm. frankly, to be considered that main eventer that many fans and many people wanted him to be. And so for me, when I see Triple H going over Benoit, it doesn't fill me with the anger or resentment that might fill other people. Um, who are like, no, this is ridiculous, Chris Benoit should be going over Triple H just because he's he's married to Stephanie. And that's all well and good. But for me, even if you look at the reactions of the, the people in the crowd, when both of them come out at the start of the match, it's, it's, it's different. It's like apples to oranges. Uh, Triple H is the star in this one. He should go over Benoit. I completely understand, though, the inconsistency in that criticism of it, because uh, I do agree that if you've got to have a character, there should be some consistency. Or just if you're going to have them have shades of grey, there should be a logic to it. It shouldn't just be whatever uh, floats your boat at that particular time. No, yeah, absolutely. It, it does make sense. I, I can see your point from that view. Um, now that we've analyze Chris Benoit and Triple H and what's happening backstage to death. Um, we move in to our second last match of the show that we're going to discuss. It's the match that is most discussed about. Um, <coughs> fuck's sake. Surprised to see Stone Cold and Rikishi go on at the hour mark, considering this is Stone Cold's first match in 11 months. This is Sto- obviously I know because you had to get involved in the main event later, but it kind of, I think, dampened the mm-hmm. the Stone Cold return for me. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that, oh, by the way, it's main event in the first hour, it's Stone Cold versus Rikishi. You're like, no, this, this is a blood feud. This is this is a feud based on the fact that Rikishi tried to kill Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. Um, this is a match built on the fact that a man tried to take another man's life. Surely, if ever there was going to be a match, either in a cage or in a hell in a cell, or main events a pay per view ahead of a WWF title match, it's this. Yeah, I completely agree, and uh, there's a lot I dislike about this. Actually, to be honest with you, Ross. Now, I get Steve Austin's one of the biggest stars that you need, but and I get also that a lot of people didn't like the Rikishi turn for a lot of reasons. But if you're doing it, you need to get behind it, and I feel what happens here does absolutely nothing for Rikishi. Does absolutely nothing. Because he gets a bit of offense in an Austin for a for a while. But mostly it's just Steve Austin beating Rikishi out of the arena out of the arena, taking him outside and then trying to get his own back, try to kill Rikishi essentially is what is what Steve Austin's trying to do. And I feel just that this shouldn't have happened if you're not gonna have the actual match 
we should have had Rikishi's found another way to incapacitate Stone Cold or something and have him announce the winner by forfeit uh, from Mick Foley, thus building up his heel heat a bit more. Um, and then at that point, he retains his credibility by the time he reappears in the main event. But what happens is it's Steve Austin's made Rikishi look like a chump. It, it, he's made him look like no real threat to Stone Cold Steve Austin. So if I was to continue watching and I put myself in the position of a fan at the time, if this was my first introduction to it, I would think Rikishi is just some bum who's going to just be a bump in the road for Stone Cold. He doesn't feel like an, the next main event heel, which should have been the intention for them if they were revealing him as the attacker, you know? Yeah, you can absolutely see why it was revealed that Triple H was end, ended up being the guy who Rikishi might have ran him over, but he did it at the instructions of Triple H. Mm -hmm. um, you can see why, but... Something else I think that takes, like we talk about shades of grey and how sometimes that can, that can make a storyline that bit better. Like, oh, they had reasons and they they're legitimate reasons, you know. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons Rikisha gave when he ran over Stone Cold, which they completely gloss over in the promo after they say, "I did it for the, I did it for the Rock. I ran over Stone Cold for the Rock." When he says he did it for The Rock, he goes into a bit of a monologue where he talks about how Samoan and Samoan Americans and people from, you know, the islands, his people had been held down the likes of, you know, Jimmy Superfly Snooker was one of the most over superstars in WWF history. He never got his shot at the title. Rock was always overshadowed by Stone Cold. The fact that people used to come in and get given gimmicks of savages and cannibals and barbarians mm -hmm. you know they were looked down upon that he goes that's one of the reasons i ran over stone cold they completely changed that in the promo package and yeah. now it just makes rikishi look like a homicidal maniac and you're like no keep that in like because you could have had tranquil yeah you could have had someone like the rock turn around and say, you know, don't use our heritage to hide behind the fact that you try to kill a man, you know what I mean? You could have had different elements seep in. Mm -hmm. You could have had, you know, the likes of Superfly Snooker, who was still alive, disown Rikisha. You could have had the Wild Simone saying, Rikisha, you, you know, you're not one of us. Don't, don't use us as, you know, an excuse. There, there was just there was so many things there, as you mentioned, Rikishi isn't treated as a threat here to Stone Cold Steve Austin, despite the fact that he's walking about with a sledgehammer all night. Yeah, and I do think I've always liked that idea of we know about um, the Anoahi family, and I've always thought they've missed a trick with having a full-on like stable, uh, but uh, not a stable that plays on the gimmicks so, like that Rikishi calls out in that promo, but just like a stable of prestige. Can you imagine in the heyday? Imagine Rikishi had been. Um, presented as like a credible top heel, right? And then imagine that you have the two very talented wrestlers who made up Three Minute Warning debut a bit earlier alongside him. That's a powerhouse faction right there. You know what I mean? And th there was ample opportunity you had with a guy like Rikishi, who, let's be honest, he has a very good look. Um, there is something about him there. Um, but they've just completely squandered it, and you're right in what you say, Ross, like the, the, the things that you alluded to there, which I didn't personally know about, that makes this storyline ten times more interesting to me than it is just, oh, Ricky Shea, I did it for my, my pal The Rock, mm. you know what I mean? Um, we'll, we'll talk about where Ricky Shea goes after, when we talk about the main event, because it also dilutes what ends up becoming a rock Ricky Shea feud. Mm -hmm. they, to the lowest common denominator. Um, mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, Stone Cold has the majority of the offense. He gets Austin and, sorry, he gets Rikishi in the pickup truck. I like the setup they've got where it's just the massive big exit. And as soon as you go through the entrance ramp, you're outside. Mm -hmm. um, he takes Rikishi out, he puts him up against this sort of stone-like structure. <laughs> he put, props him up, he goes to run, Rikishi over and then a cop car cuts across to stop Austin committing vehicular homicide basically yeah uh, 
Austin still tries to drive with the police car attached to the front of his truck. <laughs> At this point, a bunch of police cars appear and they all get out of the car and just say, hey Austin, get your hands up, we're taking you to jail. And yeah. the match, it's our second no contest of the night. Um, it's it's a weird one that I remember watching it at the time, even even as an eight year old, being like, This doesn't make much sense, like why are they doing this? Mm. And I did think at the time Rikishi's treatment was a bit a bit stupid and as you mentioned, it you're seeing it for the first time. Why, if you were viewing back then, would you want to continue to watch and invest in, in Rikishi? I don't know. I have no actual clue because um I do like the production aspect of it. It's pretty cool when you get all the police cars coming in and all the lights and he crashes into the car. That's exciting, you know, that's just good action. You know what I'm saying? Um, but at the same time, from a storyline point of view and from, like, if you're looking at it from a booking perspective, uh, you've got to keep Rikishi's stock high and you've instantly turned him heel, made a, a good promise and start with it um, and then buried him straight away. Instantly, he looks lesser and then those guys in the main event scene. Um, we see an ambulance take Rikishi away, we see the police cars take Austin away, as, <laughs> as JR, who is Austin's best friend, he says, you don't lower yourself to someone else's level. Stone Cold took it too far tonight. Mm -hmm. Which I did like, I do like how the commentators call people out. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a smart thing, because if JR defends him, then he becomes Byron. You know, like, uh, JR's a more intelligent man than that. He's a man of his own moral code. He's not just going to agree with the baby faces all the time for the sake of agreeing with them. And that's the difference between a guy like JR um, and lesser commentators is knowing when to admit those defeats and then it has more impact when JR, you know, turns against a face. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so... The last match we're going to discuss, the WWF Championship match, WWF Champion The Rock taking on Kurt Angle. We alluded to it, alluded to it earlier. There we go. Um, <laughs> in the Triple H Benoit build up, Angle won a triple threat number one contenders match. He now has Stephanie McMahon as a business associate. The Rock. The storyline here is The Rock has a lot on his mind. It was The Rock rental car that was used to run down Stone Cold Steve Austin. Despite Steve Austin saying he knows Rock had nothing to do with it, Kurt Angle's thrown it in his face going, oh, I bet you I bet you knew, I bet you it was your friend Rikishi. He's now got definite man to worry about. He's got the bombshell that his cousin ran someone down for him. And he's going up against possibly the best wrestler in the company. And it re the promo package really does a good job of making Kurt Angle look more and more like a despicable out-and-out -out heel and not just the deluded, self-important, thinks he's the face Olympic athlete. Hmm. And it makes The Rock look as if the odds are just too great for him to overcome. The thing is, like, at the same time, because the feud is slightly overshadowed and dependent upon the actions of Rikishi Austin. To me, going in, it felt like this was somewhat of an afterthought, um, and, it and it felt like Kurt Angle was just the opponent that The Rock was going to have to beat to eventually go into an, an inevitable title programme against Rikishi um, coming a bit down the line. And it wasn't the case. The, the things that you're alluding to there, Ross, I think they do play pretty well, obviously. Um, it's, a, it's a very widely booked match. <laughs> they, they booked the fuck out of this match. Sorry, sorry with the language. Uh, you obviously have Stephanie and her shenanigans. Uh, you have uh, uh, Triple H getting involved because he did say if my wife gets hurt, you know, I will inject myself into this situation. Uh, you have Rikishi getting involved, uh, looking bloodied as hell, uh, almost like a, a zombie risen from the dead um, coming in at the end. And... It is a good match up until that point. Part of me wishes that it'd been there was less elements to it because I think Rock and Angle are two talented enough wrestlers and they proved that uh, to put together an amazing match just on their own. Um, but having said that, uh, Kurt Angle 
proving himself as to be a heel that is able to think his way into a championship situation um, is a great wrinkle of his character, a well-deserved champion. And yeah, it was a really enjoyable main event to the show from my perspective. Yeah, yeah, Kurt Angle proving that he can be a heel that thinks himself like a championship situation, as you said. Um, obviously, you weren't a fan of all the shenanigans, I think, because I grew up in the Attitude Era and I, I grew to expect that. And whenever we see in current WWE, when it's at the minute it's the Seth Rollins Kevin Owens feud, where the likes of the Viking Raiders, Alistair Black, Buddy Murphy, AOP, crooked referees, crooked officials and what have you are getting involved. I always refer to that as like a sort of attitude era style match and this to me encapsulated the era. So I think it's maybe just um point of view for, like if you've grew up with it or if you've if you're watching it for first time without context. But before we get into the actual match itself, I did enjoy how Kurt horrendously edited together a interview with The Rock. Yeah, that's hilarious. I loved that. I loved when he said how he, <laughs> when a fly flies about The Rock, he goes, well, we all know what flies are attracted to. <laughs> it's really good stuff because it's just um, another way for him to get under his opponent's skin and it's clear as day what he's doing, you know. Um, and it plays into it, it plays into this this character, this side of his character that's going to do whatever it takes to win, but he'll also do it with a smile on his face. Um, and I, I really, I really quite like that, I really dig it, especially you need a heel that's able to outthink um, your babyface opponents at times. And I think adding that, like I said, adding that element to Kurt Angle's character, it made this a very enjoyable main event match to watch. Yeah, um, and it's leading in. It's a bit of a shame that his title run is sort of overshadowed. Like I'll just, I'll give you some of the things that happened during this feud. Um, when he faces the Undertaker, it's basically a squash match that he wins via interference. He, th this is something I don't see. If you're going to have the six man hell in the cell, which they did have, you either have. Angle went her first and he has to watch as the cage fills with lions trying to take his prize. <laughs> or you have him enter last and he has to look into the cage with five hungry competitors that want to take his title, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, they had they basically had people enter in case of how WWE were booking them at that point. Yeah. So it was Rikishi in first, Triple H in second, Angle in third. Undertaker, Rock, Stone Cold. That that was how they entered at Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And then it was something Scott pointed out to me. Um, Triple H and Kurt Angle, when they feuded the months prior to this, it was over Stephanie. They'll feud at the Royal Rumble, and it's over Stephanie and Trish, both trying to win Vince McMahon's approval, because both women are in the corner of tri uh, Triple H and Stephanie, eh, sorry, Kurt, respectively. Yeah. And then years later, when they fight at WrestleMania 34, it's over the head of Ronda Rousey trying to get her hands on uh, Stephanie McMahon. So, yeah. a lot of things that happen with Kurt Angle's title run that kind of overshadow him. But at the same time, there's something special about going back, I think, and watching someone win their first title, their first big title. Because yeah. you know there's got to be loads of titles after this for Kurt Angle. You know the company had the utmost faith in them. And it just, it, here, it just shows, and I think there's something special about that, you know, regardless of what the booking was after. Yeah, it feels, it feels a big moment. It feels a shocking moment. Yeah, it feels like a surprise, but there, there's no one who deserves it more. Um, I was thinking the other day about Kurt Angle's most recent run, the return to WWE that was ended at the hands of Baron Corbin. And it's night and day because I hate, I wish younger fans listen to this or shows like this and watch pay-per-views like this because Kurt Angle, when he's at his best, might be better than anyone to ever have done it. 
because Kurt Angle understands professional wrestling. He understands when it'd be funny. He understands when it when it'd be goofy. He understands when it'd be intense. And he is a character who can do anything that you ask of him. And that's not just like in the, a journeyman workman sense in the mid card. It's it's a guy who can do it at the highest level against top caliber opponents. And he makes whatever feud he's in entertaining and must watch. And he comes against The Rock here. If you didn't think that he was main event before this match, there are no questions about it by the time he walks out with the championship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, you mentioned Triple H gets involved. Um, he pedigrees The Rock because The Rock went after Stephanie, even though she was in Kurt Angle's business. Kurt Angle gets a punch for his troubles because he's mm. bringing Stephanie into harm's way. Um, Rikishi comes out, accidentally hits The Rock because Angle grabs him into the corner. Accidentally kicks Rock because Angle ducks. Yeah, Angle it's the Angle slam on Rock. It's a clean pin in the middle of the ring, and it does the thing of giving Angle the big win, but at the same time keeping your top star, The Rock, looking looking as if it was just too much on that night. You know what I mean? Yeah, he just had too, too much on his plate. <laughs> the only thing I will say is this is the second uh, time I've been on this show. This is the second time that The Rock seems to be, and The Rock as champion, seems to be an afterthought to the McMahon-Helmsley drama. And I think it does damage your perception of The Rock a wee bit. And I said this the last time because it's just like, he becomes a blander figure if you're not putting the focus on him, if you're not giving him the promo time, you know, if you're not letting The Rock be The Rock. Obviously, he's still beloved, but th there seems to be something missing. It's more of a neutered Rock, I feel, at this, at this stage. Um, and maybe that's just the case with Rock as champion. I don't know, like, do you feel The Rock was better when he wasn't champion, when he was the one chasing the belt? Or I think it's a weird thing because this is the peak of Rock's popularity. And when he was chasing the McMahons and he was going up against the McMahon faction and all that, there was, you know, that big triumph at Backlash mm -hmm. when he wins the title. But then you know, more and more things happen, such as, you know, at Unforgiven, the main thing is Triple H versus Kurt Angle over Stephanie. SummerSlam, those two guys are in the main event with The Rock, but you wouldn't know The Rock was there. It's sometimes, yeah, The Rock, when you go back and watch, especially in 2000, The Rock does get lost in Triple H and McMahon drama. Yeah. And it's only until about 2001. I mean, even you could even say he gets lost in the McMahon drama because WrestleMania 17 is remembered for McMahon turning and joining Austin. Yeah. Sorry, Austin turning and joining McMahon. Exactly. So it's not until he comes back during the invasion and he's just sort of his own character that The Rock kind of escapes that McMahon drama. And I think he needs that because... It's one of these ones where I'm watching, and obviously you're watching The Rock, it's great, and watching The Rock in his prime, that's fantastic. But I don't quite get it just from watching these pay-per-views, why The Rock goes on to become one of the biggest stars in Hollywood history. You get what I mean? I'm not getting that yeah. level of Rock, I'm getting a good level of Rock, but it's a Rock that reminds me of, of a, a 2006 John Cena. It just seems like the top guy. You know what I mean? There's no real flavour to him. He's not really getting a chance to, to show what he's made of on these pay-per-view matches because of the booking around him. Um, and that's obviously, we don't watch the Raws leading up to this. I'm missing that part of it. But just from watching the pay-per-views exclusively alone, it just seems like he's shortchanged a wee bit. Yeah, it's ironic that people kind of go at him and Cena for making Miz look like the third wheel when The Rock for the majority of 2000 when it comes to certain man-related stuff. Yeah, within that position. Like, it's made to look like the third wheel, yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I don't buy that with the Miz thing, you know, it's a wee bit of a tangent, but the Miz was elevated just from even being in the same sentence as John Cena and The Rock, you know what I mean? So I don't buy that for a second. Yeah, it's, it's a weird one. He's someone who... The Rock, you know, he wasn't WWF champ for at least 
13 months from mm-hmm. when he lost at WrestleMania 99 to when he won it back last 2000. He was still incredibly over. I think there are, yes, there is something there that whenever he gets too high, they just, I think they maybe bring him down a bit because they don't want him getting too popular because they still get Stone Cold to come back. Yeah. I don't know if that was thinking. I don't know if it was a case of at the same time they didn't want to make him overly popular at Triple H because they were going to turn him face eventually. Mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't know what the thoughts were, but there is a lot to be said for how he's booked in the WWE title picture at this stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. But overall, like I say, good match, fun match, um, and happy to see Angle walking away with a win. <laughs> it's, um, it's JR's reaction. You know, if I won the WWE title, I'd cry. You know, yeah. I, I know I know for a fact you cry whenever you win the SSR title. Uh, oh, you so, know, you know there's a five-day bender of a celebration. <laughs> <laughs> so it's JR just like, look at him, he's crying. It's <laughs> <Just> the <a> disgusting <laughs> JR voice. <laughs> That's when I'm JR's at his best, even JR sounds like he's actually just going to lose it. That is, that is JR at his best, and there's no one better at reacting to heels than Jim Ross. Um, it's, it reminds me, do you remember the run where JBL was commentating on the, um, uh, what are they called? I forgot, the Ascensions matches. Yes. Uh, back before, uh, <laughs> and then he cuts that promo, I think it's at Raw 1000, where he just the starts laying into them <laughs> when they come out and interrupt the New World Order. And it reminds me of that a wee bit, like that level of disgust is always good in a commentator because it's hilarious. It's the same way with Graves and Sasha Banks as well, if you're talking even more modern. Um, I do enjoy when a commentator gets like really, <laughs> really upset about the, the, ch- the chances of a certain performer. <laughs> um, I can't I, so I obviously turned this off at the end of when when you see Kurt Angle crying there was two yeah. minutes still on uh, just because we were going to record straight after it yeah I don't know if it's on the network version or if it's on like a home video exclusive it's a YouTube clip but The Rock rock bombs Rikishi at the end of the show yeah. just to send it home happy was that on the network one? I think it was on the I think it was on the network one. It's been it's been a week since I've watched it. So what I, you're lucky I'm at my desktop computer right now, Ross. Uh, it's a really marvelous technology. Uh, let me just skim towards the end of this, the end of what's happening here. Never mind. I put on the wrong show. Cactus Jack is fighting. Oh, never mind. Reboot. Reboot. <laughs> I put on No Way Out 2000 instead of No Mercy, sorry. (laughs) Fucking hell. (laughs) Wrap up, wrap up. (laughs) This is what lockdown does to people, folks. (laughs) Exactly, I've just went delirious. (laughs) But yeah, rock, rock, bottom, Rikishi to send the fans home happy. I alluded it. I alluded to it earlier. I can't say alluded for some reason. I alluded to it earlier um, that they lowered what would be a rock Rikishi feud to the lowest common denominator. The next night, um, Rikishi Rock calls out Rikishi and asks him to explain himself. Rikishi says, "I'm sorry, but whether you like it or not, I'm going to continue to help you." And the mm-hmm. Rock book says, "No, we're done. Stay out of my life. You cost me yeah. the title." And instead of becoming a personal blood feud, instead of it being about legacy, instead of it being about, you know, Rock defending the legacy that Rikishi tried to hide behind, it Mm -hmm. results into just Rock at the lowest common denominator, calling Rikishi a thong-wearing fatty, calling him fat, (laughs) calling him him fat, so Rikishi saying, "You're you're hurting my feelings, and then the Rock Rock bottoms him, and there's... It does get a, Rikishi does get a bit of an edge about him, but at the same time, what could have been a great feud again is lowered to the lowest common denominator. Yeah, and I, I don't like when WWE do that. They have a tendency to oversimplify things instead of leaning into those nuances. Like I said, lean into the legacy of the, this of the, the Anuai family, which you've got at your disposal there. You know, and for them to just take the simple way out of it again, it's more disappointing when you know what's available and you know what they have there. 
So I completely, I completely agree with you. It's, it's, uh, it's quite frustrating in that regard. So just as we wrap up our review of the main show, um, what would you give the show out of ten? I'm probably going to give it a seven, uh, which may sound harsh. Like I've said, there was some real good on it. Um, but I just feel the overall through line of the storyline at the time kind of polluting into everything else. There was a couple of filler matches. Um, I, I'd say seven's probably fair, for, I'd say. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I'd maybe go seven as well. Just There is good matches, there is filler. The, the Austin Rikishi match annoyed me when I watched it back in 2000. Yeah. It baffles me now, and as you mentioned, I never really thought about it until you said it, but the other stuff is seeping into the likes of Triple H Benoit, which was a good match, but to me, knowing what's going on behind the scenes at this point mm-hmm. irritates me. Yeah. And then it seeps into the main event, and I've still not forgiven Rikishi for costing the Rock the title. So, you know, the, if there's one good thing about it is that, you know, uh, the Latin Americans, you know, they got their heroes uh, in the Conquistadors' first tag team title reign. Uh, gone but not forgotten, you know. Uh, what would you say was your match of the night? Match of the night? Oh, that's It's a tough one. Because uh, obviously we just talked about the main event, which I think was good, barring the shenanigans. But from a match of the night, I'm actually going to go with Jericho X Pack inside the cage. Because, like I said, 10 minutes, concise match, told all the story, was brutal, was just a really fine wrestling match. So, match of the night, I'll need to go uh, Jericho and Mr. Sean Walton. You bastard, I was going to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, mate, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll settle for. Los Conquistadors against Matt and Jeff. I like the commentary. I like JR trying to trip up King. I like King calling out JR, trying to call him, you know, all the names under the sun yep. because he knew it was Edging Christian under the masks. And Edging, anytime Edging Christian fight the Hardy Boys, it's always a great match. Yeah, like we said, we mentioned the comparisons to New Day and Usos from the modern era. That's what Matt and Jeff and Edging Christian were to the Attitude Era. Uh, you never really get tired of seeing them go at it and there's different wrinkles you can add going down the line but there's something to be said you go back to the days of the Freebirds and the Von Erics there's something to be said about tag teams who just can't keep out of each other's way and the idea that they're going to be doing this until the day they die these two dynasties going at it and that's what I like if you see that through line Von Erics, um, Freebirds, Matt and Jeff and Edge and Christian New day, so as you're going to get your premium tag teams going at it like that to the end of time, and I will love those sort of rivalries. So go for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so thank you very much for listening. You'll be listening on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, and all good Android podcasting sites uh, to our Suplex Retweet extra feed. But you can also use those platforms to listen to Eat Sleep Suplex Retweet, where you get our weekly show every. Thursday and you get our interviews, previews and reviews uh, there as well. A plethora of shows on Suplex Retweet Extra such as Saturday Draft Live, The Great Rock, show. Anybody Back to Wrestling, Albuquerque Graps, Four Way Fatal, The Wednesday Night Wars, Power Trip, Eats Meets West, East Meets West and so so much more and of course at Suplex Retweet Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. And, of course, SuperLexRetweet.com, our shiny, but not new, but still good, website. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, David Campbell, for joining us on your farewell tour. Listen, the farewell tour is rolling into the debating chamber um, on Wednesday. And I'll say this, you know, you and the GOAT, we've had a history. You know, we've said things to each other in the past, designed to art each other. We've had a good friendship, a good te- we were teammates at a point. But we've always respected each other. You know, and that's the key difference as to how I feel about you and those other chumps that are going up against me in the debating chamber on uh, <laughs> on, on Wednesday uh, to be released on Thursday. I see no problems in how I'm going to defeat Daniel Campbell and David Hockney, but it'll be a pleasure to step inside the chamber with yourself again, Ross. 
God, the way you described that rivalry, I, I could almost hear Limp Biscuit playing in the background. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> if this is WrestleMania 2000, we are Triple H in the uh, in the Rock, and they are yes. <laughs> the other two. <laughs> they are the other two that just kind of over it. Yeah, exactly. You know, we don't need to worry about them. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you were there at the second anniversary show. I broke three quarters of that fucking room. Yes, yes. And I will say I made Strat cry in the first five minutes. So we're we're gonna have we're gonna have a great time. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for listening. And remember, during this pandemic, stay inside. Thank you. Bye bye.